You are listening to episode number 68 of the Everything Ham Radio podcast. Today, we're going to be answering the question of, are you weather aware? We're going to talk about uh, W5KUB and his Hamvention Marathon this next weekend. We talk about some upcoming events and contests as well as some ham fests over the next two weeks. And we talk about our Facebook question of the week for this week. So stay tuned. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Everything Ham Radio Podcast. This is episode number 68, and I am your host. My name is Curtis, my call sign is Kilo5 Charlie Lima Mike. This episode is released every Thursday morning. You can find the show notes of today's episode with some additional links. I've got a whole bunch of pictures in there. i got a whole bunch of extra information in there, so I highly recommend that you check out the show notes of today's episode. You can find that at everythinghamradio.com forward slash podcast forward slash 68. That's the number 68. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash everythinghamradio. I'm on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash everythinghamradio and on Twitter at K5C. LM. Okay, so first off, like I said, we're talking to... Okay. You know, about a week ago now, probably about two weeks by the time this comes out, back on April 29th, about 100 miles to the east of me, we had uh, four tornadoes touch down. And at least one of them um, was rated at an EF4. And it went through a fairly decent-sized city of about 3,500 people or so. And it's a small uh, town called Canton, Texas. Um, there was a uh, the EF4 tornado that basically went through the city itself, um, was on the ground for nearly two hours, and it went about 52 miles long. And that's just one tornado. And there was like three or four others. There was uh, two EF3s, uh, a couple EF1s, and I think one EF0. So there was quite a few uh, tornadoes that happened in this small little area. And, you know, for the the days leading up to this, there was some talk about severe weather. Uh, from the weather service and from uh, meteorologists on TV in the area saying, you know, we could expect some severe thorn- storms, but there wasn't really any talk about uh, any kind of threat of tornadoes other than just the usual, okay, yeah, there could be some tornadoes, but it's really low. Um, they also said that the storms would start up further west than what they actually did. Uh, we were actually gearing up at my work. Uh, I was working the day that this happened for some storms and at home for some storms because they had talked about it. It starting actually right over where I live and where I work at. Fortunately for us, it didn't. And it started up about oh, 60 miles or so to the east of me. Um, and then really got bad uh, about 100 miles to the east of me. Which leads me to the question that I ask myself. And then I'm asking y'all here on this episode is, are you weather aware? Now, by weather aware, I'm not saying, you know, yes, I watch the news every night. And yes, I watch the weather and, and stuff like that. I have a, a weather app on my phone. And if I see something, if I see something that looks kind of funny in the sky, you know, I bring up my phone, I pull up the radar. And, oh, yep, there's some red stuff. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, are you aware enough of your surroundings to understand what's going on in the sky because you're not always going to have your phone. You're not always going to have your cell phone service. You're not always going to have a TV, things like this. And unfortunately, as good as radar is now, I mean, we have some really awesome radar technology here where I live at. Um, One of the news channels have like one of the most powerful radars uh, in the United States. And there is a, uh, a radar system that's being built here in my local area. Um, It's called the CASA radar system. And it is a network of radar stations. Um, And there's like 13 of them, I believe, in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex that's either up or that are going to be up. Um, And 
These are very high definition radars. They're close enough together where they can see the low level uh, activity of what's going on in the storm. And the reason I mention this is because if if you know at all what a what a radar system does, okay, basically it sends out a beam of energy, basically radio waves, out in all directions. And that beam travels out, and the further it travels away from the radar site, the higher up that radar beam goes because of the curvature of the Earth and also because the radars are typically not at zero degrees elevation at the radar site. They're typically like you know anywhere between two and five degrees of takeoff from the radar site. So when you get out to about five miles or so from the radar site, that radar beam is actually about 10,000 feet in the air. So you don't, most radars are not able to see, actually pretty much all radars are not able to see after about five, six, seven miles or so from the radar site, what's going on at the lower levels. And at the lower levels is where a lot of the stuff happens. You know, the tornadoes, the, uh, you know, you get the uh, indications of like hail and stuff like that. Yes, you will in the upper, upper, upper atmosphere as well. But the lower side is where all the action happens. And that is why the uh, National Weather Service had started the Skywarn program all those so many years ago. And why they try so hard to get uh, qualified storm spotters in the field so that we can be their eyes um, in a storm to see, you know, what's going on. You know, a lot of times is, um, here locally, we've had uh, people, uh, spotters out in the field say, okay, well, I see, I see a rotating wall cloud and I see a funnel starting to form. And the National Weather Service will take that information of what at least two people see and they'll issue a severe uh, or a tornado warning because of what that spotter sees or what those two spotters see. Now, if one person sees it and says, oh, well, I think it's a tornado or, you know, yes, it looks like a funnel, but I'm not really sure and there's nobody else that can see it, they might not. But if they if somebody does see it and they see indications on the radar, some rotation, they might. But oftentimes, um, the local storm spotters will see more than what a National Weather Service radar will see, and they'll use that information to issue the severe thunderstorm warnings, the uh, tornado warnings, and so on and so forth. So, one of the things that I wanted to talk about in this episode is the different types of um, storm potentials that go on and... And at the risk of sounding kind of morbid a little bit in this episode, what some of the storm-related fatalities are uh, in the weather service. Okay, now you know as much of you as most of you know, you know when a tornado happens, there's going to be unfortunately people that are killed. You know when a hurricane comes through, unfortunately people are going to get killed. Um, flash floods. You know, some people are not all that smart and drive through the water and get swept down the river and, and end up drowning. But the one thing that really shocked me the most when I was looking up information for this, I was looking at weather at fatality statistics due to, due to weather. And the number one um, weather event that causes the most fatalities on average, over the past 10 years, is not tornadoes, although it does, it, tornadoes are a very close second. Um, it's not flash floods, it's not hurricanes, it's heat. Now, you think about it, okay? You know, here in Texas, yes, it gets really hot. And in Phoenix, yes, it gets really hot. Trust me, I know I lived there for over a year. Um, you know, here in Texas, it can get very easily 105, 110 with, you know, 60% humidity. And, you know, I can I can guarantee you that it, when it's that hot and you're outside, you're going to sweat. And because you sweat, you lose your nutrition in your, in your body, you lose the water in your body, and you get dehydrated. And if you get dehydrated enough, you can get really sick and even die. So... 
over the past 10 years, the number of, or the average number of fatalities in the United States is 113 deaths. And that's, a, like I said, a 10-year average from 2006 to 2015. If you go back to a 30-year average, it's 130. Yeah, 130 people per average per year die because of heat stroke or heat exhaustion. And, you know, you think about it, it's like, okay, well, why didn't they just go in the air conditioning? Why didn't they just, you know, get in the car in their air conditioning or, you know, something? Well, it, it's not always that easy. And, you know, I might be going out on a limb here, but I know that I've been told by some people that a lot of people in the northern states don't have air conditioning a lot sometimes. You know, they might not have air conditioning because it doesn't normally get that hot in the north, right? Now, I could be very wrong on this, and if I am, I'll, you know, I'll gladly stand correct, uh, stand corrected. But, you know, over the past three or four years, I know I've seen on, on my local weather uh, station where places like Chicago and New York and, you know, places up north that typically don't get that hot during the summer, you know, they, you know, 90 degrees or so is typically the highs, have been well over 100 degrees. And there's been times where people in Chicago were hotter than it was here in, in the DFW area. So, one, the people that live up north are not used to the heat like we are here in the south, okay? Two, they might not have air conditioners. They might have like a swamp cooler or something like that. Or, you know, open windows in the breeze. Um, or, you know, they very well may have air conditioning. So at least they have a car with air conditioning, right? You know, there was a point in time where people, in, when cars were sold in the north, they didn't have air conditioning. But anyways, you know, that's neither here nor there in a long time ago. But even down here where it's typically, you know, air conditioning is typically a thing that you have. There are times where you don't have them. You know, there are times where it's so hot and so many people have on their air conditioning that it overloads the power grid. And when the power grid grows out, you have no AC. And when so you have no AC, so you get hotter. And you know, typically the elderly, the young, the um, more unfortunate uh, people. Uh, I'll just say that. Um, might not have the stamina or the, um, not even sure the word I'm looking for, but they're more susceptible to the heat than a person that's, you know, middle age or younger or, um, uh, is more fit. Maybe, um, I'm kind of stepping on toes here. I'm, I'm afraid. So please don't judge me. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that, you know, some people are more susceptible to heat than others. And a lot of times, you know, even here in Texas, we have some elderly people where I've heard stories in the news that have died because they didn't have air conditioning. You know, they were in their house and um, didn't have AC and got hot and were just found dead one day. So while it was kind of a shock to see this initially that the over a 10 year average, the highest number of deaths uh, was heat. It's kind of understandable, right? So, you know, if, if you if you are in a place where it's hot, you know, make sure you drink water. Make sure you have, you know, some kind of fluid intake. Um, and, you know, try to keep cool as possible. So, the next thing uh, we're going to talk about is, is not the number two thing. We're going to, first off, we're going to talk about thunderstorms. And it's more especially the severe or the supercell thunderstorms. Now, again, I have pictures on the show notes. So I highly recommend that you go and check those out because there's some really awesome pictures that I found um, of each of these different types of things. Well, most of them, anyways. Um, in, in the picture that I have for the Supercell Thunderstorm, it's really neat. Um, it was taken by a, uh, a group called the Texas Storm Chasers. And in the picture, you'll see a very pronounced um, uh, thunderstorm shaft. You'll see a very pronounced uh, rain-free base, uh, a rain shaft. Um, and, it's, and it's really just a neat picture. I mean, it's taken off from quite a distance. So on half of the picture, you see this, the supercell thunderstorm. And on the other half of the picture, you see basically the setting sun. 
really beautiful picture. But the reason I say this is because if you see this type of cloud uh, formation coming your way, you can pretty much bet that you're going to be in for a pretty good storm. Um, the more the define the cloud shaft is, especially if you see um, a rotation type formation or what they call a barber pole uh, formation on the outside of the uh, storm shaft, there's going to be some rotation in it. And if that rotation is strong enough and goes down far enough into the lower atmosphere, it's a very good possibility that you're going to have a tornado come out of that storm. So if you do see these, uh, what they're called striations, um, on the outside of the tower, uh, storm tower, you really need to be looking for a lowering on the cloud base. And typically this is located right at where the rain shaft starts and the rain-free base ends. Um, and it's a trapezoidal uh, shaped wall cl uh, cloud with the longer section pointing or towards the rain side. So if you see something like that, make sure you look at it a little bit closer to make sure there's any kind of or not any kind of rotation indicators on that wall cloud especially because if you do I would wager, wager to bet that um, you're going to have a tornado or a, for, a funnel forming really uh, shortly. So next off, we're going to talk about uh, actually what happens when you see that rotate, rotation come in the wall cloud and uh, it actually forms a tornado. All right, so with tornadoes, you know, they... Of course, they form from these supercell thunderstorms, and we talked about the wall cloud, we talked about the rotation, stuff like that. So, number two in the uh, average uh, number of fatalities is, of course, tornadoes. And as I mentioned back on April 29th of 2017, there was a spawn of multiple tornadoes um, in uh, Van Zandt County in East Texas. And one of those tornadoes, like I said, was rated an EF4. Um, there was four people that were killed, at least last I heard. Um, and there was probably around 50 people or so that were injured. And, you know, granted, this is two weeks later. And after, you know, a couple days or so, you don't hear a whole lot about it on the news. Um, because it's, quote, not newsworthy anymore. So I don't know if that number has gone up. I'm sure it probably has. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's massive amounts of damage that's done. But, of course, I don't hear anything about it anymore. So, but according to the National Weather Service, there are 110 people killed by tornadoes uh, on average in the past 10 years. Over the past 30 years, if you look at the graph, um, the number drops actually down to 70. So uh, I don't know if we've had a more uh, tornadoes over the past 10 years on average or what, but... Um, if you look at the 30-year average, it's only 70 instead of 110. So, when you think about it, it's actually quite astounding, or astounding, astounding uh, being that tornadoes only typically happen during the months of about April through June or so. Uh, it's typically, you know, storm season, and then hurricanes pick up after that. But add to that, it, there's not a whole lot of warning when it comes to, to tornadoes. So it, it really amazes me that there's so many people. Well, I say amazing. It, it, on one hand, yes, it does. It amazes me that there's that many people that are killed. But on the flip side of that, like I said, there, there isn't a whole lot of warning. You know, over uh, you know the past 10 years or so, radar technology has, has increased. Um, awareness has increased. But we still typically only have, you know, about five to ten minutes of warning before a, um, a tornado actually drops and, and starts basically eating uh, stuff. <laughs> so, in, like I said, in a way, it, it amazes me and others, it does. It, it, almost in a way, it, it surprised me that it's only an average of 110. So... Um, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about flash floods, which is the third highest killer uh, of uh, people um, if you look at the 10-year average, but it's a whole lot more than that if you look at the, at the, uh, the 2015 numbers. Pretty even on the 10-year and 30-year, but the 
2015 numbers is just astounding. So stay tuned and you can find out how many uh, were killed in 2015 by flash floods. Are you tired of lousy propagation conditions and wondering how to work some real DX for a change? Maybe you spin the dial and wonder what's going on below the voice segment of the HF bands. The answer is, you're missing out. You're missing out on digital modes, a rapidly growing and exciting part of amateur radio. Work real DX with the incredible JT65 and JT9 modes. It's no exaggeration when I tell you, you will work stations you never thought possible, even using low power and compromised antennas. Have fun making new contacts in modes such as PSK31, Olivia, Radio Teletype, Slow Scan TV, and many more. The Rig Blaster Advantage is everything you need to operate these exciting digital modes. Made right here in the US, the Rig Blaster interface has set the standards for nearly 20 years. Thousands of satisfied operators have learned their Rig Blaster Advantage will provide solid digital communications, easy operating, and reliability. Don't miss out on the fun and excitement any longer. Head on over to everythinghamradio.com forward slash WMR for more information and learn how to get your free USB port monitor with your purchase. All right, we are back and we're going to talk about flash floods. Flash flood is the third highest weather killer. Uh, with 84 people being killed on average over the past 10 years. Now, I mentioned in the last segment that the average is a whole lot less than it was in 2015. And when I say a lot less, I'm talking half as much. In 2015, there was 176, yeah, you heard that right, 176 people that were killed because of a flash flood. Now, Flash floods, I'm sure most of you know exactly what they are. They're they're a flooding event that happens in a you know matter of seconds, okay? And flooding, even though it's just water, it is a very powerful thing. You know, here in Texas there's a massive awareness campaign that's been going on for the past uh, like five, six years, and I'm sure that this is all over the US at least by now, but the campaign is turn around, don't drown. And basically, you know, that's telling you, you know, when you, if you can't see the road because of water, you don't know how deep it is. You don't know if the road's been washed out. You know, you don't know a lot of things about it. So don't drive through the, the high water. You know, it only takes about three to four inches or so of rushing water to knock you off your feet if you're standing in it. And it only takes about two feet of water to move a car or an SUV. So... It's not that much, you know, and if you go through a running water area that goes over a road and it gets up to the bottom of your doors, you know, even if you're, you know, even if it's not two foot, if it's at the bottom of your doors, you know, chances are you're either one going to stall out because the water's going to get in your engine or two, there's going to be enough displacement due to the, you know, the lowness of your car or the rushing water or maybe you hit a pothole and it just gets it just you're, you, know, you lose traction or something your car is gonna move so don't don't even try it and once you lose your traction whether you're talking about traction in a car or you're talking about traction on your feet you're probably never gonna regrain regain it so the thing is with flash floods is the they're the main thing about flash floods i can't talk this morning guys i'm sorry or this evening i'm sorry um is the flash part of it it can happen in a matter of seconds you know i've seen many many videos on youtube and i actually have a a video uh, in the show notes of today's episode which is the um the seven um seven scary flash floods caught on tape or something like that i believe is what the what the title of it is so make sure you head on over to the show notes and watch that video because it's it's got some really interesting ones in there but i've seen some that are like you know it there's nothing there and then all of a sudden there's three feet of water and you know with flash floods it's not only just water that you have to deal with it's all of the mud all of the rocks all of the trees all of the debris that this water has picked up over however uh, long it's been flowing and 
that's going to knock you off your feet too, right? You know, if you have, you know, if it knocks over a tree up river somewhere and this tree is what knocks you over, you're never going to get up back up. I mean, it's good. It, okay. I say never, you have a 99% chance of not getting back up. <laughs> so, but another thing with flash floods, especially if they go over roadways is that water with the continual pounding of the, the ground under the road or even the asphalt and, and the concrete itself, it's going to eventually erode the dirt around the roadway or it's going to eventually erode enough of the asphalt or the concrete to move it. I, I saw a video one day and it really wasn't even a flash flood. It was a... Um, it, it was just, you know, it was a lot of water. Yeah, it could potentially have gone in to be a flood. But uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't over the roadway. But it was, you know, rushing pretty good. And this this water was going through a culvert, which was about, um, probably about three, four inches in diameter. Or three or four feet in diameter. And it was rushing down to this culvert, going through the culvert and coming out the other side, Right. Okay, fine. It can handle it. Well, eventually you see the road above that culvert collapse. And then a little bit more of it collapses and a little bit more of it collapses until finally there's no road above it. And all of a sudden you see this massive, you know, three foot in diameter tube that is 20 feet long come floating up to the top of the roadway and flowing downstream. You know, what, what had happened is, is the dirt or the water had eroded the dirt around the outside of this culvert and basically washed all the dirt away so the road didn't have anything to sit on. So, you know, you, you got to be careful with flash flooding. You know, that's, that's basically what I'm saying because it, it can happen in an instant and it can do a lot of damage if you're not careful. So... Um, next thing we're going to talk about is straight line winds. Now, straight line winds are something that, that really gets confused with a tornado a lot of times. A lot of times, you know, you hear people say, well, they're, they're, you know, I have all this damage to my house or all this damage to my car or, you know, my trees have gotten knocked over, so it had to be a tornado. Well, no, it doesn't have to be a tornado. Straight line winds can be just as powerful as a tornado. The only difference is, is that... With a tornado, you're going to have twisting, and with straight line winds, you're just going to have a general direction uh, of damage, right? Um, if you look at the, the show notes, there's a picture in there from the National Weather Service um, from several years ago. Um, I believe it was in Oregon, maybe, or maybe Oklahoma, not sure which, but the picture shows a aerial view of like a forest, a forest type area, and there was you know, hundreds and hundreds of trees that were knocked over and they were all laying in the same direction. They were all laying right to left in the picture. And, you know, if it was a tornado that happened, you know, some of them would be laying up, uh, you know, up and down. Some of them would be laying left and right. Some of them would be laying right to left. You know, some of them would just be like twisted wood type things. Uh, some of them just wouldn't be there, you know. So with the differences with the straight line winds and the tor- and the tornado is the way the damage is, um, and it can cause just as much damage as a tornado. Uh, sometimes, you know, depending on the category of the tornado, you know, if it's like a EF one, EF two, something like that, straight line winds can definitely do more damage than that. So there is, you know, some definite. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Some definite of something there other than just a tornado, right? So with straight line winds, you know, we've been talking about, you know, fatalities due to weather or weather factors in fatalities. Straight line winds is actually number four over the past 10 years with 56 people that were unfortunately killed by straight line winds. So you have heat, you have tornadoes, you have um, uh, flash floods, and then you have wind, just wind. Number four killer. So, you know, there you go. It, wind is wind is a very powerful thing, just like water is. 
Um, next up, we're going to talk about something that is a lot of times quite beautiful, um, and that's lightning. You know, lightning is something that, uh, you know, I love sitting on my back porch when it's storming and looking out, out over the the view that I have off my back porch. Off, I can see 10, 15, 20 miles, uh, sometimes e- some places even more. Um, and I love watching the... Um, the lightning shows, you know, the, the summer storms and late spring storms. So like that has a lot of, uh, electrical activity. I, I just love, it. you know, the, the lightning dancing across the sky, even, you know, even cloud to ground lightning, you know, is, is awesome. And, you know, the, the sheer, uh, awe, you know, all of it is just amazing. And, you know, I always thought that I knew what caused lightning, or in thunder, but it wasn't until a few episodes ago when we were talking about lightning protection that I actually learned the whole truth and nothing but the truth <laughs> um, about what lightning is. You know, I always knew that you know lightning was you know basically a discharge of electrical uh, static electricity of ice particles bouncing together and building up the static electricity and then dispelling it into the the form of lightning. And I knew that thunder was a byproduct of that. You know. But in the episode where we talked about lightning uh, protection, it went a little bit further uh, in the research that I was doing. It went a little bit further, and it, it actually, you know, kind of like, wow, you know, that that's really neat. And, you know, basically it is, you know, lightning is formed, of course, because of the... Uh, constant collision among ice particles driven by risen air causing a static charge to build up. Eventually, the static charge becomes uh, sufficiently large to to cause the electrical breakdown of the air, which causes the lightning strike. Now, when lightning strike does occur, the return stroke rapidly deposits several large pulses of energy along the leader channel. That channel is heated by the energy to over 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit in only a microsecond, and hence has no time to expand while it's being heated, creating extremely high pressure. The high pressure channel rapidly expands into the surrounding air and compresses it, and this disturbance of the air propagates outward in all directions. For the first 10 yards or so, it propagates as a shock wave faster than the speed of sound, and after that as normal as a ordinary sound wave, which is the which is what causes the thunder. So, you know that to me is like, okay, I always knew that the thunder came from the lightning and you know always like, okay, I'm counting from you know, I see the lightning strike, I'm counting one, two, three, four, however many seconds until I until I hear the thunder and that tells me how far it goes, how far away it is, you know, and all that good stuff. I've always been told that all my life. But to actually read the physical, the actually what happens and the chemical reaction and, and all that good stuff of how lightning and then thunder is formed is just, you know, it, is it all to me. You know, I love weather. I absolutely love weather. And that's one of the things that I got into this hobby for, of course, is community service. And Skywarn is one of the major uh, contributing factors to that as well. But, you know. If you look at the show notes, I've got pictures of all of the things that we've talked about so far and all the things we're going to talk about. Um, really awesome pictures. Um, a lot of the pictures came, um, are uh, in beds from the Texas Storm Chasers Facebook page. Um, they have some awesome pictures on their page, and uh, so I definitely give them all credit. Um, and they are embedded from Facebook, so when you click on those uh, pictures... You can, you'll be taken to their uh, to their Facebook page, um, but yeah. So the last uh, weather fatality contributor that I want to talk about is hail. Now hail's not so much of a contributing factor to a lot of fatalities, or but definitely is a contributing factor to some injuries and definitely to a lot of property damage. Now, you know, over the past five ten years or so. You know, there hasn't been a whole lot of people that I've heard of, you know, that got, okay, this person's cause of death is they were hit in the head with a, with a hailstone. 
You know, you don't hear about that a lot. And that's typically because when people see the Halia run for cover and get under something, and away you go. But on that same thing, Hale has been a major contributor to damage and is directly responsible for billions and probably billions of dollars worth of damages over the past five, ten years as well. You know, in case... Okay, so in case you don't know what a hell or how a hailstone is formed, this is just kind of a broad overview. Okay, basically the way it happens is a raindrop falls from the clouds, you know, and it gets caught in the updraft. The updraft pushes the water droplet back up into the storm to a point where it is below freezing, and that raindrop freezes. Okay. Eventually, it either moves away from the outdraft or the updraft, or it becomes heavy enough or far enough up where it loses that momentum and falls back down to earth. So, as it's falling through the st- through the storm cloud, it gains extra moisture on its outside. Maybe even potentially, you know, starts to thaw a little bit, and then it comes in contact with the updraft again. And the updraft, if it's strong enough, will push that that frozen particle back up into the clouds. And it'll go back up to where it's you know, below freezing again, and it'll freeze. And it'll get a little bit bigger. And this cycle continues to the point until where either one, that what is now a hailstone, moves out of the updraft and can fall all the way to Earth. Or it becomes big enough where the updraft can't lift it. You know, and a lot of times... You know, you see these pictures on the on the news and stuff about these massive hailstones. You know, that are like the size of golf balls or tennis balls or softballs or, you know, what have you. The big ones. You know, that fill your hand. You know, what kind of updraft would that storm have to have to lift up that softball size or baseball size or even golf ball size hailstone back up? You know, twenty, thirty thousand feet just to have it drop back down again. And then catch it before it hits the ground and spit it back up. You know, so hailstorms are not something to be messed with for sure. <laughs> and if you're going to be out in the hail, wear a hard, uh, hard hat. <laughs> so, um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about with weather um, is not so much of a uh, you know damage dealer or injury dealer, but it it's something that is very beautiful, I think. And something that is a very good indication of a very turbulent or very strong storm. And that is what's called a Mamata's Cloud. Now, for those of you who don't know what a Mamata's Cloud is, you can go to the web, go to the show notes and you can look at the pictures and I'm sure you've seen them before. Basically what those Mamata's Clouds are is when you look up at the, typically the anvil of a storm. The anvil is the very top, you know, you'll have the the uh, uh, the storm column you'll have at the very top it'll kind of go out uh, further away from the main column and it basically looks like the top of an anvil on the bottom of these you'll see these like little um, like little globes that are sticking out on the bottom of them and they could be you know one or two they could be a cluster of them they could be a whole bunch of them and typically these things range from like one to three miles in length or in diameter. I mean, these things are huge. They look a little bitty when you're, you know, 20, 30,000 feet below them on, you know, standing on mother earth, but these things are huge and, you know, they can even potentially be half a mile deep. That's how big these things are. And, you know, there's a lot of theories about how these things are formed and, um, you know, what causes them and, and so on and so forth. But there's no real um, consensus on what actually forms them. You know, there's things where, like, you know, the uh, temperature differential and the updrafts and downdrafts and all that stuff. But nobody really knows what causes these things. But one thing that people can agree on is that typically when you see these, you have a very strong storm coming through. And you have the potential of, or a you know, fairly decent potential of having a tornado in that storm as well. So if you want to read some about the theories uh, about how these things are formed, there is a link on the show notes to Wikipedia, or you can just go to Wikipedia and and type in modest clouds um, and and read those. They're, you know, fairly interesting. But uh, yeah, so if you want to do that, do that by all means. Uh, But uh, yeah. 
Okay, so we're going to take another quick break, and then we're going to come back and wrap it up. And, uh, yeah, so I guess stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Hi, this is Dan, KB6NU, author of the No Nonsense Amateur Radio License Study Guides. My study guides have helped thousands get their license or upgrade to general class or extra class, and they can help you too. What makes them unique is my no-nonsense style. I don't bamboozle you with a lot of text. Instead, I give you just what you need to know in a simple, straightforward way that's designed to help you pass the test. One reader even told me, your study guide explained in a couple of paragraphs topics that the license manual needed a couple of pages to cover. Another wrote, the clarity and simplicity of your descriptions blew the license manual away. My study guides are available in paperback, in a variety of ebook formats, and even as audiobooks. Get your copy today. Go to kb6nu.com slash ethr for more info. Thanks. Alrighty, we are back. Now, in this segment, we're going to talk first off about a emergency kit. Now, I'm not talking about a radio go kit. We've talked about that before here, right? What I'm talking about is something that you should have in your house um, in order to Make sure that you have the necessities that you and your family need in case you get trapped or you have to evacuate or, you know, things like that. And I'm talking about things for like, you know, a tornado coming through, you know, and your house being leveled and, you know, your your clothes being spread across, you know, two square miles or something like that. Um, And you have to evacuate to your storm shelter or your basement, or whatever, or maybe, um, you know, if your your safe place is in a basement, and your house collapses on top of you, you may be in there for a couple days before somebody comes and finds you, or you're able to get out, so you need to make sure that you're prepared, so, you know, first thing you need to think about, of course, is the basic necessities, things like food and water, um, you know, water is easy enough. You can go in to the to the store and buy you know a couple gallons of water or a gallon per person for two days or something like that. You know, that's easy enough. The food, on the other hand, can be um, can be a different story, but it doesn't have to be. You know, the food can be things like um, canned foods. You know, if you want, you know, cans of corn and beans and green beans and stuff like that. You know, the uh, raviolis or noodles or or whatever that come in cans, you can do that. You know, they last for several years. What my wife and I did when we became foster parents, we had to have an emergency kit. We had to have enough food for every person in the family to to be able to survive for at least three days. So what we did was, is we went to um, a a major camping store um, here in a local area. It's a major chain store. I'm sure you can probably figure it out. They have, you know, camping and sporting goods and all that. And I'm sure you can probably find them, you know, in a bunch of other places as well. But we went and we bought a, um, it's basically like a, maybe a three-gallon bucket, something like that that came with 48 packs of dehydrated food and it costs like 50 bucks and this food will last for years to come you know and all you got to do is add water basically you know you can heat it up if you want but you don't necessarily have to all you're going to do is just add water shake it up stir it up whatever and you have a meal you know it may not taste the best it may not look the best but it's going to it's going to allow you to survive until somebody can come and rescue you right so Water, food, there you go. There's your basic necessities. Now, something else that I would have in your kit is basically a first aid kit, for sure. You know, more than likely you're going to have, um, you know, some kind of injuries, you know, scratches, bumps, bruises, hopefully not anything more major than that. But you need a first aid kit, you know, stuff with Band-Aid, stuff with like Neosporin, stuff with like, um, um, you know, bandages and gauze and, uh, you know, gloves even, 
to not so much for protection for you, but protection from infection in the in the wound. Um, so that's that's definitely one thing I would have. Um, maybe like alcohol wipes, um, stuff like that. You know, you can go to like uh, major department stores or home improvement stores or you know places like that and buy a pre-made first aid kit. You know, my wife and I have one in each of our vehicles. We have one in our house that we made ourselves in a, in a tackle box. So, you know, there's several ways you can do it. Um, some of the other things you can, probably should have are things like flashlights, um, maybe a lighter, um, in case, you know, you need to start a cook stove or a fire or, or what have you. Um, maybe to, um, sterilize a needle if you so need to have something like that. Um, extra batteries, you know, uh, maybe a, a pack of AA batteries or a pack of C batteries or something, depending on what kind of flash, what batteries your flashlight uses. Uh, but definitely have extra batteries for that. Um, maybe a weather radio, you know, get one of those handheld uh, weather radios you can buy for like 20 bucks or something like that. Um, maybe like, maybe an extra set of clothes, you know, because who knows when a storm hits you know, if it hits in the middle of the night and you sleep all natural, you know, how, how is that going to look when your rescuers find you in your, you know, in your birthday suit um, and you don't have any extra clothes and you have to sit around in front of your kids or, or what have you, or guests, you know, heaven forbid, um, with no clothes on. So an, an extra set of clothes or, you know, at least a pair of shorts and a shirt or something like that um, is good to have. Or even, you know, pajamas. If, if that, if you so choose, but at least, you know, at least one extra set of clothes per person that will last you until you're rescued. So, um, I'm sure there's probably other things that you should have in your first aid kit. That was just kind of the things that top that popped into my head as I was, as I was thinking about this, uh, this episode. But, um, if you have a first aid kit and, and I didn't say something and you think that everybody else should know about leave a comment in the show notes or on facebook and uh, give your ideas of what uh, should be in your first aid kit or where you got yours if you got one of the pre-made ones so next up we're going to talk about having a emergency plan so with a emergency plan and you know i'm talking about these things like you did when you were in high school when you were in elementary school and you had a tornado drill you know, you lined up in the, in the, you know, single file, you lined up along the hallway, you, you know, got down on your knees and, and put your head down on the floor and put your hands over your head and what not, what have you. You know, you also have things like fire evacuation drills, stuff like that. So all these things are a good thing to have for your household so that everybody knows what everybody's supposed to do or where everybody's supposed to go in case something like this happens and you don't have just absolute chaos, you know, at least you have some kind of, you know, a controlled chaos instead of just absolute chaos. Right. So, you know, make up a, a, a picture of what your floor plan is like and where each bedroom is and draw, you know, sit down and draw. This is the evacuation plan that you're going to take from your bedroom to both exits or all three exits or however many exits you have. Um, you know, if, if it's a fire that you have in your house and this part of the house is cut off, how are you going to get out? You know, if it's a, for a tornado, you know, where are you going to go? Are you going to go into an interior closet? Are you going to go to the basement? Or do you have a storm shelter out back? You know, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? And who is going to get what kid? If you have kids, you know, my wife and I have four. So, you know, it's like, okay, well, you're going to get the, the baby and I'm going to get the three older kids or, you know, I'm going to get these two kids and tell this kid to come on, you know, who's going to get what, you know, and then on top of that, you know, is there anything else that you need to get? Are there any, uh, readily available, you know, documents that you have to have, you know, that you can get to at, you know, a couple seconds because that's all you're going to have. You know, do you have a flashlight that's on a charger uh, sitting by the back door and you need to grab that flashlight so you can see, you know, you know, all these things you, you should practice, draw up, practice, practice, practice. 
so that when something does actually happen, everybody knows what everybody's supposed to do. Okay? Now, when you first make this up and you first sit down with your kids and your wife or your husband and you talk about what each person is supposed to do, where each person is supposed to go for whatever event, practice it. You know, practice it two or three or four times that first day. Maybe that first week, do it twice a day. And then after that, you know, you can kind of drop off. Maybe once a week for the first month. And then after that, do it once a month. But definitely make sure that you do it. And definitely make sure that you continue to do it on a regular basis so that everybody knows what everybody's supposed to do in an event of an emergency, right? Because when when you don't practice and you don't know what to do, even though you know you have a evacuation plan on your wall, like we're required to according to uh, the foster care rules, even though it's on the on the wall there, and we've told our kids, you know, this is where you're supposed to go. You're supposed to meet it at the flagpole in the front yard in case the house burns down, or you're supposed to meet in the interior closet of our house in case of a uh, um, a tornado. Or something like that. Even though you've told them what to do. If something were to happen. Unless you do it. And do it. And do it. You're not going to have what's called the muscle memory. Or the. You know basically autopilot. Happen. And it's going to be. A nightmare. Because it's going to be. You know you're going to be. The. uh, You're going to be in flight mode basically, or maybe even freeze mode. You know, you have your, your three basic modes when something happens, when something scares you, you know, your fight, flight, or freeze. Those are the three, th- three things you're going to have. And unless you do something consistently and regularly, those three things are going to be more predominant and something potential could happen or it take you longer to get somewhere or... You know, and you know, maybe somebody gets hurt because of it. So, practice, practice, practice on what your emergency plan is, and that's where I'm going to leave you. That you know, we've talked about weather, we've talked about uh, an emergency kit, we've talked about an emergency plan. I think that pretty well covers the question: Are you weather aware? Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to our. Uh, our blog topic. I found a really neat blog that I want to share with y'all um, in case y'all didn't know about it. All right, so I didn't mention this at the, at the top of the show, which I which I have been trying to do. I totally missed it on last episode. But our Facebook question of the week is, are you going to be at Hamvention? And that's about what our Ham blog, blog spotlight is about. Now, if you're not going to Hamvention and you would like to see maybe what it's a little bit of it, a little bit of it is about, head over to K, uh, w5kub.com. Uh, this is the address to the um, Amateur Radio Roundtable, which live streams every Tuesday evening, uh, and you go to w5kub.com forward slash live to view that. It's actually going on right now as I record this. Um, but over the past, I believe like 10, no, 15 years, um, he has been doing a webcast during Hamvention. This year he is doing uh, more than 48 hours of live webcasting from or for Hamvention, starting on May 17th and continuing through May 22nd. And this includes the road trips out and back. Um, this will mark, like I said, the 15th year that he's been doing this. Uh, and this year's webcast will be called uh, Hamvention 2017 Marathon by Medlin. Um, astronaut Douglas Wheelock, w, or, uh, K5, KF5BOC, that's Kilo Foxtrot 5 uh, Bravo Oscar Charlie, will join him as a co-host. Uh, this live event is structured to make you feel like you are there. Webcast viewers will be able to communicate with other viewers logged into the chat room and can even chat directly with the webcast team at Hamvention. Medlin also promises nonstop prize giveaways. You will see many familiar people and celebrities drop by and get on camera 
to say hello to you. Over the course of this Hamvention webcast, he interviews visitors and offers a view of the show from his particular perch, uh, which will be booth 5006 at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Zeno, Zena, Ohio. So Hamvention is right around the corner. It's literally next weekend, you know, like, what, 10 days away now? Um, Kale and George and Jeremy from uh, Ham Radio 360, they're going to be there. Uh, MTC Radio will be there, and they have a, a brand new 28-foot uh, trailer that they're bringing up and a lot of stuff that they're bringing up. Um, of course, W5KUB will be there. Um, our uh, K, what is his call sign? KB3IHF, who makes the QSL cards that I tell you all about. He will be there. So if you see him and you're ordering QSL cards from him there at the show, make sure you heard from him about him on my show, please, because I'll get a affiliate marketing or affiliate uh, dollar amount. <laughs> my mind went blank there, but I'll get affiliate commission. That's what I was looking for um, by by mentioning that you heard about him from my podcast. So please do that. And if you go, do go there. Uh, say hello to him. He is an awesome guy. Randy is, um, and he will do you right and make you an awesome set of QSL cards. Um, that pretty much wraps it up for the ham blog spotlight. We're going to move on to the upcoming events. All right. So in our upcoming events, we have quite a few of them. Um, and just as a reminder, all of the times that I'm going to be saying are going to be in UTC or Zulu time. So make sure you adjust accordingly to your local time zone. First up is the Jakarta DX contest on 40 meters, which is on May 13th from 10 hundred hours to 2200 hours. The Portuguese Navy day contest, May 13th from 1100 to May 20th at 2300. The HPC worldwide DX contest is on May 13th from 1200 hours to the 14th at 1159. The SKCC weekend sprintathon is on May 13th from 2000 hours to the 14th at 2400 hours. The VOLTA WWRTTY contest is on May 13th from 1200 hours to the 14th at 1200 hours. The CQ-M International DX contest is on May 13th as well from 1200 hours to the 14th at 11:59. We have the Arkansas QSO party which is on May 13th from 1400 hours to correction May 13th at 1400 hours to May 14th at 200 hours. The MARAC County Hunters Contest is on May 13th from 1400 to 2400 hours and on the 14th from 14 to 2400 hours. And this contest, from what little bit I've read about it, it's pretty cool. You know, it's like mobile uh, DX competition type thing. You're looking for counties. So that, that that's pretty neat. Uh, next up, we have the FITS, F-I-S-T-S, Spring Unlimited Sprint, May 13th from 1700 to 2100 hours. The WAB 7 MHz Phone Contest on the 14th of May from 1000 hours to 1400 hours. The UA2 QSO Party on May 14th from 1300 to 1659. Four States QRP Group Second Sunday Sprint, May 15th from 0 to 200 hours. The Agene RTTY Contest, May 20th from 1200 hours to the 21st at 1200 hours. Uh, His Majesty King of Spain Contest on CW, which starts on the 20th uh, at 1200 hours and goes to the 21st at 1200 hours. The EU PSK DX contest on May 20th from 1200 hours to the 21st at 1200 hours. And last but not least, the Baltic contest on May 20th from 2100 hours to the 21st at 200 hours. All this information was taken from the WA7 BNM contest calendar, which you can find a link to in the show notes of today's episode. Let's move on to some ham fest, shall we? Alright, so in our ham fest, we have quite a few of them. And of course, we have the upcoming hamvention in Xena, uh, Ohio. But we'll get to that here in just a second. First off, this weekend, this coming weekend, this Saturday, I believe, uh, the 13th, is the 13th annual Rockingham County Swamp Fest in Reedsville, North Carolina. 
the second annual Greater Midwest Radio Show in Hastings, in Nebraska. We have the East Greenbush ARA Hamfest in East Greenbush, New York. The EPARS Tailgate in Dade City, Florida. Iowa Section Convention in Boone, Indiana. Or Boone, Iowa, rather. The PVARC Annual Tailgate in is in uh, Roswell, New Mexico. The RCARA Tailgate Trade-A-Thon, Trade-Around, rather, is in Ashland, Kentucky. And the SCARC's 26th Annual Hamfest and Electronics Flea Market in Stanwood, Washington. Next weekend, on the 19th, we have the Ohio State Convention 2017 Dayton Hamvention in Zena, Ohio. That one is going to be pretty awesome, I do believe. Uh, it sounds like it's going to be anyways, this, especially this new, uh, um, what do you call those things? New uh, venue. Um, I think it's going to be pretty neat. I'm actually looking, hopefully, to maybe uh, interview at least one person that went to Hamvention and see what their thoughts of it is. So if you go to Hamvention next weekend and you would like to be on my show, uh, please shoot me an email uh, and let's chat. And let's talk about Hamvention and what you thought of it. Um, next on the 20th, we have the 26th Annual Hamfest in uh, Groshen, Connecticut. The Suwannee ARC Hamfest in Wellborn, Florida. And the TARC Tailgate Hamfest in Goose Creek, South Carolina. On the 21st, we have the Flea at MIT in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. And last but not least, we have the North Hills RC Hamfest in Carmichael, California. All this information was taken from the ARRL Hamfest calendar, and you can find a link to it in the show notes of today's episode. Alrighty, so that pretty much wraps up the episode today. If you have stuck with me this far, thank you very, very much. I greatly appreciate you listening all the way through the episodes. It gives a warm fuzzy feeling inside of me to know that you do that a um, couple things real fast um, if you haven't checked out my new swag store make sure you do I have coffee cups I have uh, mouse pads I have um, uh, coasters which I'm using right now for my drink here while I'm recording this podcast as well as the mouse pad as, as a matter of fact um, and I'm working on some other things as well I'm working on getting some t-shirts and some hats um, made up haven't quite figured out exactly where I'm going to do that yet, but I'm working on them. And, of course, I'm working on making some custom uh, call sign desk plates as well. I'm working on making one for my for me so y'all can see what it looks like to see if you want to buy it. But it is up there now. If you would like to be the guinea pig of what you think about it, please, by all means, go ahead and buy it. And maybe I will give you something extra as well. Um Maybe I'll give you a coaster or something as well, <laughs> or a hat if I ever get them. Um, if you need some QSL cards, make sure you head on over to uh, uh, to KB3 IHF, uh, his website, which you can find a link to in today's show notes. Uh, he will make you an awesome deal with some uh, with some QSL cards, and if you mention that you heard it. Uh, about him on my show like I said before I will get a affiliate commission for that and I greatly appreciate it um, I greatly appreciate all the contributions and the help that have been given to me as well as my sponsors um, if you would like to help uh, support this podcast there are several ways you can do it uh, you can do it through a one time donation through PayPal you can become a per episode contributor through Patreon which you can do for as little as $1 per episode which makes it $4 a month so not a whole lot of money, but uh, it is greatly appreciated for, for that. I actually have one person that's been doing it now, one dollar episode now for about three and a half months, and I greatly appreciate his support. Um, it it does come in handy when it comes time to pay the bills. Uh, last or another way of doing it is shopping through my affiliate links. Um, my main one is through Amazon.com, uh, which you can go to. It doesn't change your price any at all. Uh, basically, I will just get an affiliate commission for anything that you buy, or most anything that you buy. And there has been some people that have been doing that, doing that here lately, and I greatly appreciate that. But uh, if you would like to do that, you can uh, find out how by going to the support page at everythinghamradio.com forward slash support. 
or if you want to just uh, shop on Amazon or through MCM Electronics, which I also have an affiliate uh, account with, you can go to the main page and on the sidebar there's two links there uh, which will take you to that. So um, if you have not done all uh, ready uh, as well, uh, become a subscriber to my email list. I don't send out a whole lot, basically just podcast um, uh, emails on when I publish a new one. Uh, typically, you know, if I, on the rare occasion I do a blog post, I'll send one out as well. Um, and maybe a couple little announcements. I don't send out a whole lot of emails. So I don't expect a lot, you know, one, maybe two a week is all they're going to get from me. So I'm not going to spam your inbox and I'm not going to sell your, your email address to anybody. Trust me. I hate spam as much as you do, but if you would like to sign up for my in, uh, email list, there's a couple ways you can do it. You can go to the show notes, scroll all the way to the bottom and fill out the form there. Or you can go to everythinghamradio.com forward slash subscribe and fill out the form. Once you click the sign me up button, you'll get an email uh, in your inbox um, with a link that you will need to click before you will start receiving emails from me. So with that being said, uh, I guess pretty much all the else, um, social media. Um, if you want to follow me, follow me on Facebook. You can join the new group that we have. We are growing pretty well. We have over 100 members in the group already. Uh, just over the past month or so, uh, which you can find at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash uh, everything ham radio. You can find me on YouTube uh, with, at uh, youtube.com forward slash everything ham radio. And I'm going to try, I know I've said this in the past, but I'm going to try to put something a little bit more than just my logo in my YouTube videos. <laughs> I know it's really boring just to look at my logo while you're listening to it, but I'm going to try and get a little something extra. It's not going to be live video just yet. I'm still working on that. You know, maybe put a little camera up here while I'm recording this or something. Um, but that's a little ways down the road. Um, and last but not least, you can follow me on Twitter at K5CLM, which is probably where I'm the most active at. Uh, so if you need to get a hold of me, uh, you can send me a message or send me a tweet or something like that. Um I guess that pretty much wraps it up, and I greatly appreciate all of y'all listening. I greatly appreciate all of y'all um, sharing my podcast with your friends. Um, last week's episode, um, as I'm recording this, it is now Tuesday. Uh, last week's episode where we talked with uh, Ian Kahn about PSK31 has already reached number seven um, as of this recording on Tuesday. Number seven of my all-time uh, ranking on every every all 67 so far podcast episodes number seven can you believe that y'all and it's only like five days into it so um it was i know it was a great episode and i hope that y'all really enjoyed it and i've actually got my station partly set up i have my hf radio here i have my antenna tuner out Uh, i have my power supply set up Um, i don't have my antennas put up yet but i'm working on it i'm working on y'all and I need to find my rig blaster. I don't know where it went. I thought it was in the box with the radio. But I'm looking for it. I'm looking for it. Because I really want to get on PSK31 and check that out. Um, I guess that pretty much wraps it up. Uh, thank you all very much for staying with me this long. I greatly appreciate it. And I guess until next time. This is K5CLM. Signing out. 73 y'all.